All right, our next presenter is Shafali Sony. It's someone uh, we all know very well. Um, she's our infection control coordinator, although I prefer the title infection preventionist uh, because really that's ideal in this world is that we prevent infections before they happen. A lot of what we talked about already is how we can prevent infections. However, as you know, it's still our number one complication in burn injury. Um, so Shafali, who's not our, only our infection control coordinator, but an epidemiologist, is going to talk a little bit about infection prevention and the burn wound. So I'll just right and left, pretty straightforward. Okay. okay. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay, so um, I'm going to cover a few different things. Um, as you all know, I'm Shafali. Um, I hope that you know who I am at this point, given the fact that we're in a global pandemic. Um, but I'm going to try to cover some non-COVID stuff today. Um, there's a lot of objectives. I have kind of transformed this presentation over time um, to, to go over not only what we see um, in terms of infections in the burn population, but also uh, you know infection control, antibiotic resistance, and um, how antibiotics work, and then some uh, determining factors in, in terms of how antibiotics are prescribed. And those are a little bit more geared towards the provider, but you may find yourselves in a provider role one day, um, and it's also just helpful to know what that process is uh, when you're talking to patients and families. So some basics about burn wound infections. Um, you probably notice this uh, throughout your work here at Shriners, but as the depth of the wound increases, so does the likelihood of infection. Um, you know, they can be bacterial, viral, and or fungal, and your skin is the greatest defense against infection. So you have to think about your skin kind of like a raincoat when you have a raincoat on, you can go into you know, a tropical storm and for the most part, your clothes stay dry. However, without that, you're going to be soaking wet and it's the same concept loosely for a burn wound infection. Um, foreign pathogens, when you have skin, can be washed off your skin if they're transmitted via contact route. Um, otherwise, you know, they're gonna stick to that wound bed and opportunistic pathogens are gonna proliferate um, so it's really important uh, to kind of identify where patients are in this process. Uh, common infections include burn wound infections, pneumonia, bloodstream infections, and UTIs. Um, so you can see uh, one or all of these in uh, a patient who has a burn. Obviously the more severe the burn or the larger TBSA, the greater risk of having more infections. So colonization and infection are two things that I really want to um, understand the difference between. Um, just because a patient has a presence of an organism, it doesn't mean that they have an infection. So this drawing is crudely like where you see some organisms um, and some different diseases. Uh, I think through epidemiology and different research, they find that you know you may have um, strep infections only in your like oropharyngeal uh, space versus pneumonia is gonna have a slew of other pathogens. So colonization is really when you have organisms living uh, on the surface of the burn. Um, that means that they, you know, they could be there when you culture them, you may grow them in a lab, but it's not causing any systemic effects or any local infection um, in the patient themselves. So it typically happens within five to seven days of the burn injury, so you're going to see um, both endogenous and exogenous uh, colonization. Some of it is gonna be natural skin flora and some of it may be foreign pathogens either from the site of the injury, uh, you know, the initial hospital visit or, you know, things from the uh, hospital and the, the caregivers. So you typically determine colonization primarily through a wound swab and this is just, you cannot use a wound swab to determine infection. Um, basically, all of you have taken one of these. It's just that cotton swab. You wipe it over the area that you see the most exudate or just any wound, and it's going to give you a quantitative result of one plus, two plus, three plus, or four plus. And what that means is when the lab plates it on an agar plate, they're going to look at the four quadrants, and if colonies grow in all four of them, it's going to show four plus. So it gives you um, a little um, bit of knowledge on how much bacteria burden there is but really there's no denominator there. It's uh, purely um, you know, just an idea of what's growing in the patient. And if you do a tissue sample, there have been some correlative studies showing that there's gonna be less than 10 to the fifth gram of bac or bacteria per gram of tissue. 
uh, versus an invasive infection, which would be greater than 10 to the fifth. Now, I've seen this happen. Um, you know, the patient has uh, an invasive de infection defined by clinical diagnosis, and then they also have uh, greater than 10 to the fifth uh, bacteria per gram of tissue, but I've also seen it uh, the other way, where their tissue samples are negative initially, and they're showing signs of sepsis, and then eventually you do identify the infection. So it really is an entire picture that needs to be taken into account. The reason I want everyone to understand the difference, specifically as a nurse, is that you need to be able to identify what about a patient um, and the whole picture is going to alert you to notify the provider, hey, I think something's off here, or when you're looking at the culture results, or if the parent asks you a question about the culture results, that you are able to interpret them um, with some degree of knowledge. So burn wound infection, there's no um, standard definition. Uh, I think there's a lot of research on this. Um, what clinicians and researchers and scientists can agree on is that um, histology is the best way to define a burn wound infection. So it would be defined as invasion of viable tissue by um, you know, fungal or bacterial organisms. And so this picture right here shows invasion of filamentous rods in viable tissue, and that would be done by a pathologist through tissue samples and frozen sections and different staining techniques. And then the picture below is kind of what you would see um, just in a patient, and the clinician would probably look at this and be able to determine in conjunction with the clinical signs and symptoms whether or not that patient had an invasive infection. So invasive versus non-invasive, it's not a clear cut, it's not black and white, they're not check boxes for this, but it's typically defined by a combination of the physical exam, the histology, and then signs of sepsis, which are the signs, symptoms, and uh, lab results. But not one of these kind of stands alone, you need, you need them all together. Non-invasive infections, so this is uh, three different examples of something that you might see. This may be, you know, what you typically get as an observation patient, um, a small burn over the weekend, you see them in the treatment room and then they're discharged. Um, it's a non-invasive infection marked only by erythema, which is basically when uh, you show signs of inflammation and that redness is caused by those inflammatory mediators coming to the surface of the wound and creating that little bit of redness. Uh, it's gonna happen pretty quickly after the injury and you're not gonna see any induration like you do with cellulitis. So cellulitis is kind of a step further um, where you're gonna see more pain, edema, induration, tenderness, and the appearance may change um, from the date of the injury uh, over several days. You may even see premature S-star uh, separation and then exudate, so some pus, it may have a foul odor and then change in color. You could have sepsis associated with it, especially if it goes untreated. Um, so the treatment for this, if you see this um, in the treatment room, is typically going to be IV antibiotics. Um, depending on if the culture was taken, sometimes a PO antibiotic may be uh, more useful here, depending on the size and location, and then autografting, um, or you know maybe letting the the burn declare itself and wait a few days to see if you know there's any healing that happens on its own. Impetigo or ghosting is something that you're going to see later on after grafting. Uh, all of these are commonly um, categorized by a causative agent that is gram positive, but I have seen uh, both cellulitis and impetigo caused by um, things like pseudomonas in the outpatient population. I think that's more a, a factor of our environment and what we see in our patient population. Each burn center, um, if you look at epidemiological reviews of burn wound colonization and the flora that defines each burn unit, it can be varied depending on the, the flora in the hospital. And we happen to have a lot of multi-drug resistant organisms coming in because of our patient population. So I have seen this caused by pseudomonas. Basically what happens is it's a loss of epithelium from a previously grafted site. So a patient may be discharged from the ICU, they may be healed and closed, and then they see this phenomenon happen in the outpatient setting. And a hallmark of it is going to be like what looks like little tiny circle blisters. Um, so you, in this situation, may want to get a quantitative culture in order to treat with antibiotics. That patient may need IV antibiotics if it's a resistant organism that has no PO options, but uh, you know, daily wound care, uh, debridement, 
Um, so having somebody put eyes on this frequently is the best way to treat that. So um, non-wound infections uh, can often exist in conjunction with a wound infection, and it's really important to look at things like pneumonia because uh, not only is this one of the greatest uh, contributors to mortality in the burn patient, but there's also a high morbidity, and it can be direct or hematogenous. So this is an example of hematogenous pneumonia, and this is a lung specimen, um, a section of the lung seen on autopsy, and all these little white nodules, um, when you touch them, they're pretty hard. So this would be uh, very indicative of pneumonia, a pneumonia finding on autopsy. And hematogenous um, or direct, the difference there is you may see direct pneumonia when in the clinical presentation of the patient during their stay in the ICU, maybe it was aspiration um, or just they had previous colon oral colonization with organisms that eventually um, traveled into their lower respiratory tract and you know, if they were also on a ventilator, that could increase the chance of having pneumonia or not getting up at the edge of the bed. Some of the things that Caitlin had discussed, those are also um, pneumonia prevention tips. So the more that a patient can sit up, cough, um, remove those secretions, the better they're going to fare in terms of not getting a hospital-acquired pneumonia. Um, sometimes you see hematogenous pneumonia only on um, the autopsy and it wasn't evident on the chest x-rays or clinical findings but it's typically defined um, by infiltrates on the chest x-ray, so basically fluffy clouds. Um, if you ever read some of the x-ray uh, findings, it may never say a definitive pneumonia, but it's up to the clinician to look at the x-ray in conjunction with uh, signs of sepsis and the characteristics of the sputum or respiratory specimens in order to determine that diagnosis. So a chest x-ray alone is not going to give you that information. Um, it's also valuable to look at the differences between the respiratory specimens. So if you're suctioning um, a patient and you're only getting the, uh, if you get their upper respiratory flora and their lower respiratory flora, you're gonna have some contaminants and that might not give you an idea about what's causing the infection. Um, typically candida um, and other yeast may colonize your mouth. Uh, so, and those are not really indicative of pneumonia or lower tract infection. So, Getting a BAL or bronchoalveolar lavage specimen in the operating room uh, is a very valuable and pure specimen that can tell you much more about uh, what's growing in the patient's um, uh, in the lungs. And it's also similar to the tissue versus wound specimen where you have a denominator that the lab can look at the, um, you know, the amount of bacteria per a volume of sputum specimen. You can also use gram stains for any respiratory specimen, and that's just a preliminary reading um, prior to plating and growing that organism. Fungus, so um, we also see a lot of mold and yeast in our wound infections. They can also cause um, respiratory infections, and they can get into the bloodstream and um, into the bladder. So invasive fungal infections can increase mortality by 40%. I think this is really important because when you identify it or you see it just visually on admission, sometimes we see things like this when a patient's delayed several months um, and they, uh, they didn't have proper excision or fasciotomies on admission, then you may have that mold proliferating and growing and then when we receive that patient, um, you know, amputations may be needed after looking at that uh, pathology specimen. So you would take a section of viable and non-viable tissue, send it to the um, path lab, and they would look to see if there was any invasion of viable tissue, and that would indicate to the physician, with the entire clinical picture in mind, do I need to amputate, um, how much, and where. Um, common yeast that we see are Candida albicans, Paracylosis, and Tropicalis. Having the um, species and genus of the yeast is important because you can't treat Candida tropicalis with the same antifungals that you can treat albicans and parasylosis. So that will help you depending on where the uh, yeast was isolated and how much of it was isolated. Common molds include Aspergillus, Fusarium, Mucor, and Alternaria. We typically use azole antifungals. Um, you've seen Bori being used a lot and fluconazole, um, but sometimes we'll use POSA and also with very invasive infections or when we see Mucor,
We use amphotericin B, um, and that can come in either a topical form or a liposomal form. Um, and so there are certain antifungals that are last line, um, and they have severe toxicity, but if you're weighing you know, amputation or invasive infection, it may be called for by the, by the provider in that situation. So on the left you see candida infection, and on the right you see an invasive mold, and that's typically marked by dark black dots. Sometimes it's difficult to tell with an electrical burn because you may see uh, just black markings because of that, the nature of that burn mechanism. Um, but it's important to, to get cultures in this, in this situation to differentiate. Viral infections, so the most common viral infections that we see in this population are CMV and HSV, cytomegalovirus, and herpes. Uh, oftentimes we see a reactivation of a primary vi uh, viral infection, let's say they had it when they were very young, and then the burn injury causes um, a loss of you know, their normal immune function, and we see this come up uh, as their skin heals. So this is typically treated with Valgan or acyclovir. Um, we can also do some sort of serology testing to see um, if you know, their labs or their clinical symptoms are due to a virus rather than bacterial infection. So a differential diagnosis is sometimes needed because these lesions won't present normally in a patient who doesn't have skin. So sepsis, um, the ABA criteria is uh, as follows, to, if you've worked in other populations or what you've studied about the SIR criteria, um, moderate to severe burn injuries are going to have an inflammatory response. So things like white count and temperature, uh, those are going to be elevated in any patient with a burn, regardless of an infection or not, just because they are in an inflammatory state. So that is natural for a burn patient to have a temperature of greater than 38 sometimes. So the ABA came up with a consensus definition um, in 2007, um, and I can provide some of these resources to all of you um, on the public drive um, if, if you do wanna look at this. So uh, the definition would be having three of the following, but uh, you know some of the criteria are uh, subjective, like um, clinical response to antimicrobials or uh, tissue sources. So you're gonna look for a very high or a very low temperature progressive tachycardia, and tachypnea, thrombocytopenia, so you wanna look at uh, causes that are um, unrelated to resuscitation, and then hyperglycemia in the absence of diabetes, and then inability to continue enteral feedings, which may be marked by uncontrollable diarrhea, but as you all know, that a lot of these patients have diarrhea all the time. So it's, just as I've been saying with everything else, it's important to look at everything um, holistically and together because not one of these may not give you enough information and you do not want to risk over treating or um, over excision, things like that. In addition to these criteria, you may look at the culture results to supplement the physical exam, um, the path tissue sources, uh, which is more valuable than just a wound swab, and then clinical response to antimicrobials, which you should typically see within uh, 12, 24 hours of administration. So antimicrobials, I like to talk about this because I think it's important for um, providers and clinicians and frontline staff to understand that we are in a, a state of the world where antibiotic resistance is more prevalent every day. In our population, we sometimes lose sight of the fact that antibiotic resistance occurs because we see such resistant organisms and uh, you know, the, the response and what is right for the patient is oftentimes to use last line antibiotics for a long period of time uh, because you really don't know how effective it's going to be in some of those guidelines that were created for normal surgical ICU patients uh, will not work here. So I included this quote by Alexander Fleming um, about penicillin, which essentially, um, you know, the part that I highlighted, in such a case, the thoughtless person playing with penicillin treatment is morally responsible for the death of the man who finally succumbs to infection with a penicillin-resistant organism. I hope this evil can be averted. So, you know, take that as you will, but the point there is that um, we should be thoughtful about the way that we use antibiotics because there will be a time where slowly we will not be able to use the ones that we were able to use 
10 years ago, 20 years ago, or even last year. So antibiotics um, are chemical substances derived from biological sources or produced by chemical synthesis. Antibiotics grow in the environment all the time, often from molds, um, and they can be in the form of antibiotics that treat bacteria, viruses, uh, fungal organisms, and parasites. So uh, this is just a crude picture of how antibiotics affect bacteria. Basically, what it tells you is that antibiotics affect something about how the cell functions, either how it keeps its contents inside, um, like the cell wall synthesis or membrane function, or metabolic pathway, um, like a folic acid pathway. So you want to target something about how the cell lives every day, and if you can target that and inhibit it, then essentially the cell will not be able to continue to live and you'd be able to eradicate that bacteria. Um, I like to talk about colistin because I think it's a pretty unique drug in our population. Uh, we haven't used it a lot lately. I think the pandemic has changed kind of the uh, patient population that we normally have. Uh, colistin is a last line antibiotic. Uh, it was used a lot in the 70s, but because of um, toxicity, it's been used less and less. However, with the emergence of multi-drug resistant organisms, we see it being used a lot more. So it's a cyclic polypeptide antibiotic. It disrupts the cell membrane and results in leakage of the cell contents. So it does that by binding to the cations on the lipopolysaccharide on the outer membrane. So it can only target gram-negative organisms because gram-positive organisms will not have this as a cell component. So essentially it acts like a detergent, breaking the cell and causing the cell contents to leak and hopefully cell death. Um, polymyxin E is colistin, which is the IV analog of polymyxin B, which is usually nebulized. However, recent studies have shown that polymyxin B is not as effective for oral colonization of gram-negative organisms. So you use colistin primarily for multidrug resistant organisms as a last line. And an MDRO, which you heard a lot about already, is defined as an organism resistant to three or more classes of antimi antimicrobials which are commonly ter termed as first line. So things like VRE are considered um, multi-drug resistant, but they may not be resistant to everything, just vancomycin. But um, since vancomycin resistant enterococcus uh, has been shown to cause increased mortality or sepsis in some populations, um, it becomes one of these trigger alerts for infection preventionists in hospitals and may trigger things like isolation. Um, MDROs are dangerous because they're difficult to treat. Uh, and then when you have limited antibiotic options to treat them, uh, you're going to need to do other things like isolate and prevent them from spreading. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is our most common MDRO at Shriners and Galveston. So we see strains that are um, resistant to um, everything except for colistin. We've seen strains that are resistant to everything except for some newer drugs called Cervaxa and Avacaz. And then we see some that have varying degrees of resistance. Um, our go-to drug for that right now is uh, Piptazo or Zosin. So other common MDROs that we see are Acinetobacter, VRE, MRSA, and Clevnumo. Um, this is often carbapenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae, uh, which is reportable, and uh, you know Acinetobacter is also reportable. But what I've found in my experience at Shriners is that these are often much easier to treat than Pseudomonas. And that can be attributable to some virulence factors that Pseudomonas has. These are some pictures of patients with uh, Pseudomonas. You have um, just like a wound infection. As you've probably experienced, it's marked by this like noxious smell. I can't actually smell Pseudomonas, which is kind of sad given the nature of my job, but most people can smell it. It smells like cornflakes or grapes. Um, something I like to let everyone know, and I hope I don't ruin your relationship with your dogs, but the, that cornflake puppy paw smell when you get a new puppy, it's because of bacteria. It's usually Pseudomonas and Proteus. I by no means mean to discourage you uh, in smelling your puppy's paws, but that typically is what the reason is. I imagine that it's not a resistant strain though. Uh, another market of Pseudomonas is ecthyma gangrenosum, which is basically when you have uh, these nodes that form in vessels. And I've only seen this on autopsy. I haven't seen it um, when a patient is septic, but um, this is something that is a hallmark of a pseudomonas infection. So 
this is just to say that you know all of the infection prevention measures that we have at Shriners and kind of in hospital systems are to prevent your most high alert pathogens. We don't do isolation for these burn patients for MRSA because our research and our epi review have found that MRSA does not contribute to um, mortality in these patient populations or significant infection at all. So we have to target our efforts um, to reduce the risk of patients getting things like pseudomonas because we've seen that to be the highest mortality and morbidity in this population. How does resistance occur? So it's either intrinsic or acquired. Intrinsic is much easier to understand because it's just based on how the organism is built. So as I mentioned before, uh, colistin can only affect um, gram-negative organisms because gram-positives don't have that outer membrane and the lipopolysaccharide to uh, bind to. So this is a gram stain um, of gram-positive uh, organisms in clusters, and this is gram-negative rods. This is going to be the growth indicator that people see on the gram stain. Um, correction, it's not really a growth indicator, it's just an indicator itself. It doesn't tell you anything about what's growing. This is likely going to be seen in a patient when you have a specimen that has a high bacterial burden. Sometimes the specimen will grow on a plate uh, and the gram stain wasn't available. So um, penicillin is also not effective for gram negative bacteria because it uh, primarily uh, binds to penicillin binding, binding proteins. Um, and then carbapenems are not effective for things like stenotrophomonas. Colistin is not effective for stenotrophomonas. These things are uh, important to know when you don't have um, a sensitivity panel. So if you're kind of looking at an elimination basis and all you've got is a species or a gram stain, you can narrow down your um, antibiotic regimen based on that information. Acquired resistance. So acquired resistance happens either through mutation or gene transfer and you've got um, vertical and horizontal. Vertical gene transfer um, typically happens through cell replication. Um, vertical gene transfer is typically through spontaneous mutations um, where like a base pair uh, is changed and sometimes that can happen just because of environmental pressures. Um, and then those uh, cells replicate. Uh, maybe an antibiotic course wasn't finished or um, the wrong antibiotic was used and so those cells will pro proliferate and spread. Um, horizontal gene transfer uh, is more common, so you see those either through transformation, transduction, or conjugation, which is direct cell-to-cell -cell contact, and this is um, the most common where you see uh, resistant plasmids that contain genes that confer resistance and those are directly transferred to recipient cell. Um, donor uh, cell to recipient where you have a bacteriophage is one other method where that um, virus is going to use the bacteria as a host and transfer uh, resistant genes directly to that DNA. And then you also have sometimes uh, resistant genes are available in the environment and then taken up by the recipient cell and contact is not necessary in this situation either. So this is, you know, it's not something that you need to take to heart and learn, but it's just interesting to know that these are the different ways that resistance can occur. Um, so it's not just kind of some magical thing. It happens over time. Some of them have, some of these resistant genes have been available in the environment for hundreds of years, and some of them are, um, you know, mutate through selective pressure. So the mechanisms of antibiotic resistance, as I said before about how antibiotics target bacteria, the mechanisms of antibiotic resistance are going to be to combat that. So you're going to see uh, things like um, making it less effective for antibiotics to tar uh, have a target. So um, through the genes, they're going to modify those targets to make them uh, less effective for the antibiotics. Um, changing the, um, the penetration of an antibiotic if it affects the cell wall mechanisms or the membrane synthesis and then sometimes creating degradating uh, enzymes that will just degrade the antibiotic completely so that it becomes non-functional within the cell, and then sometimes just creating efflux pumps that remove the antibiotic from the cell altogether. So uh, there's lots of different ways that uh, these things happen. The one that I want to talk about the most is carbapenemases. So this is something that we do test for um, in our pseudomonas and some other gram-negatives. And the reason that this is an ongoing public health problem is because uh, 
you're seeing more and more uh, bacteria that are resistant to things like meropenem and imipenem, which have been used for a long period of time, and that has created um, some selective pressure on growing resistant organisms. Uh, and you'll hear things like KBC, VIM, IMP, OXA. There's like five standard uh, carbapenemases that are usually tested for. Um, and enzyme mediated is important clinically because uh, if you have some of these um, enzymes, they'll inactivate your first line antibiotics. So you've probably noticed that we prescribe um, meropenem on admission for many of our large burns. Um, and so until we get those culture results back, a patient could be having something that inactivates that antibiotic and creates a more, a more difficult clinical picture and recovery for that patient. It's also much easier to transmit between uh, different cells. So resistance is really depressing. How do we combat it? So combating resistance happens through infection prevention, antibiotic stewardship, and drug discovery. I can only really speak to the first two, but um, there are a lot of uh, researchers out there who are looking at different drugs and different modalities in targeting uh, bacterial resistance in, in different ways other than just antibiotics. So antibiotic stewardship is something that we, all hospitals have a team that does. It's typically comprised of an infection preventionist, an ID pharmacist, an ID physician, an epidemiologist, and uh, some nursing leadership um, and ancillary staff. And the, the goal of this team is to guide prescribing practices based on evidence and guidelines. It's only there to serve as a supplement to clinical judgment and consultation. So it's not to say you can't use this or that, sometimes it may come off as that, but the goal is really to reduce um, the usage of antibiotics. Uh, so having a shorter duration, um, the appropriate dose, targeting the appropriate bacteria, um, and using them, you know, depending on the infection syndrome that's available. So you may have different, te <clears throat> different techniques such as antibiotic timeout where on the third day you're really evaluating to see do you need to de-escalate those antibiotics? Um, can you change to a different one? Can you go from an IV to a PO route? Um, look, looking at the toxicity of the, the, anti or the antibiotic to the patient, especially in a pediatric population. I think some of these things are really critical and burns because you're looking at patients who are very severely ill and who really do need those antibiotics and sometimes you're going to have to weigh the risks and benefits of those toxicities uh, with patient survival and outcomes. Um, and then the infection and syndrome. So looking at the, the source of the, the pathogen is also very important. So when you select an antibiotic, you have to look at the whole clinical picture. Um, assessing the whole patient. This is probably the one theme throughout my presentation is that you can't look at one piece of information in isolation. It's important to look at everything together. So looking at the patient pathogen and source interaction, and then um, consulting with your microbiology team to understand where those organisms are coming from. Is it a contaminant? Um, is it a true pathogen? Is it something that the body uh, considers normal flora? And then utilizing an antibiogram for guidelines and to determine the use of empiric antibiotics. And that will help you narrow down um, your antibiotic usage. And you can use your antibiotic uh, stewardship team to consult you on all of these things. And this is more geared towards providers, but it, as I said before, it's kind of good for, for you all to know. So for the path pathogen, what do we take into consideration? Um, you wanna know how this organism spreads. Um, you wanna know about the resistance pattern, which is typically found after you culture and do an antibiotic susceptibility panel. Um, what about the inoculum effect? Just a small amount, you know, and sometimes it only just takes one cell, and uh, depending on those host factors in a very vulnerable immune system, the body may not be able to clear it on its own. Virulence factors, what kind of adhesions, toxins, and metabolic products does this micro produce? So, Looking at the difference between things like multi-drug resistant acinetobacter versus multi-drug resistant pseudomonas, we find that uh, pseudomonas has much more virulent adhesions, toxins, and uh, products, creating biofilms that are very hard to remove from uh, a patient's body versus acinetobacter, which sometimes uh, we're able to treat with uh, antibiotics that are on the panel shown as resistant. Um, so looking at those things, some of them you can see from the literature, some of them are going to be from your clinical experience, um, but the goal here is to take all these things into consideration when uh, looking at you know 
how bad is this bug? Patient and source. So I talked about this already. What kind of specimen and what was the source? Uh, the sputum versus BAL specimen, a wound versus a tissue culture. Uh, was it a good sample? Could it be contamination? Sometimes when you look at the culture results and you see a bug that you've never heard of, it's a good time to call the lab and say, hey, um, can you reculture this for me? How many colonies? What was the bacterial burden? Is this something that we've seen before um, in our patient population? And sometimes we have to send things out so that we can uh, understand whether or not this is worth treating. And this is really a decision that the clinician will make. <clears throat> Are you observing any signs of sepsis? So I think doing a physical exam and looking at the labs and the cultures all together will tell you whether or not you need to treat it. Sometimes you're gonna see things like um, a rectal swab that shows VRE and the patient has no wounds on their groin or buttocks area, you may not treat it because that may be colonization um, in their gut and it may not cause an infection. However, if they do have wounds there, you may want to treat it with um, linazolid or something else because that could potentially become an infection that becomes hard to treat due to the, you know, if the patient is stooling out, things like that. And then could there be more going on than what the culture results tell you? I think this is really important. You want to make sure that you're not just calling every positive culture result an infection, um, doing a physical exam, some things are intangible, and that's really where nursing comes in, is you spend all day at the bedside, you really connect with that patient, you know what's abnormal for them, altered mental status, um, fatigue, malaysia, something that may be happening that you can tell the physician, hey, this is off, can you look into it, is really critical here. Uh, culture versus microbiome. So microbiome research is more up and coming, and we hope to be able to do this kind of testing in the future. Uh, I have this little picture here to show you that this is an open wound and all these different circles and colors indicate something that could be in the wound, either staph or pseudomonas or just regular old normal flora. Uh, and your wound swab is going to just tell you about one small thing. And typically when you look at these plates, these organisms are going to outcompete each other uh, in that environment and it's a nutrient rich environment meant to proliferate the growth of these organisms. So it's only gonna tell you a portion of what was in the wound. So if this is your quantitative culture, this is the entire microbiome. What's going to grow in your quantitative culture was definitely in the microbiome, but what's in the microbiome is not always gonna grow in your quantitative culture. Why is that important? Because when you say, you know, pseudomonas was isolated in the patient is very different from saying the patient is growing pseudomonas. The patient could be growing lots of things, but all you found was pseudomonas. So, if you see a patient who's really sick and your culture results are saying everything's negative, that doesn't mean that there's nothing there. That just means that you need to look for other things, that you need to uh, get a bigger, a bigger picture, um, and the culture results are just one small part of it. So this is what our antibiogram looks like, and selecting antibiotic for empiric usage is really important. Um, this shows a couple years. We now have, you know, 2018 and 2019. Um, what is Good about an antibiogram is it gives you a, from a research perspective and kind of an epi perspective, it's really good data. But looking at our hospital and our patient population, we see patients from all over the world um, and it's not necessarily indicative of our community flora. It is indicative of you know, patients from Mexico and some patients from Houston and some patients from Katy, some patients from Oklahoma. But they will pull all the isolates together and look at the d individual drug bug interactions and how many organisms were resistant to that drug. So it's not to say that all 60 of these have this resistance pattern, it's to say that um, among 60 isolates, 75% of those isolates were sensitive to zosin. But you know, you're looking at rates lower than 50% for all these other organisms, which, which over time, if you see these numbers changing, that can tell you either you had an outbreak which increased the uh, prevalence of a certain strain and a certain resistance pattern or uh, something in your community is changing. So, you know, if we had all the time in the world, it would be really useful to stratify all these organisms based on where a patient came from. Uh, but, you know, from a lab perspective, they really need to have a, a good number of isolates to get a reliable antibiogram. But you've seen this on the unit, you can use this to just inform you about how our antibiotics uh, resistance patterns are changing over the years and what kind of things we're seeing more of. 
So antibiotic factors are also something, this is more something that the pharmacist and the physician will look at together, looking at the relationship between drug concentration and effective activity. If it's something that you know you give just uh, perioperatively, so just like vancomycin and meropenem, a patient really benefits when you get that prior to sur the day before surgery versus something like ANSEF, that may be just good for incisions and you can give that during the surgery only. Um, you're also going to want to look at uh, you know, toxicity, how that antibiotic is released from the body. Is it um, through your kidneys? Is it through the liver? And then looking at MIC, you know, when you look at the uh, resistant panels and you see less than one or less than 16, these are not going to be created equal. You can't just say, look at the one with the least uh, amount of numbers, and that is the case because you can only compare the same classes. So for um, you know, meropenem, it may be less than eight, but for something like estrianum, it may be less than 16, both of which are gonna tell you that the, the bug is resistant to it. So there are some limitations, and it's good to understand the nuances uh, when picking or recommending different antibiotics. Duration, so shorter is better. I think more research is coming out about how shorter courses are just as effective, but these are populations uh, of patients who normally have skin. So I think the issue in burn populations is that you have immunocompromised patients who have um, very susceptible wounds for a long period of time. And so courses of like 14 days for a bloodstream infection yeah, maybe that was a was effective in um, a pediatric population of um, cardiac ICU patients, but it may not be effective for burns. So what is an effective method is to do constant evaluation, and that's why rounds are really valuable. And on Thursdays, looking at, okay, um, do they still need to be on meropenem? They've been on it for 36 days. Oh, but they're about to get a staple removal. Let's see what their dressings look like. Let's see what their wounds look like. Um, maybe we can discontinue it early. And so I think it's a constant conversation. Um, and that's why your um, infection preventionist and your pharmacist are really key here because they can engage the physician in that conversation that uh, may not otherwise happen because they've got a million other things uh, that they're looking at. So how does stewardship relate to infection prevention? Um, I think this is, I've, I've hopefully made that very clear about the role that infection prevention plays and antimicrobial stewardship and also just you know the world in general when we're looking at bacteria and viruses um, source control is obviously the most effective way to prevent infections um, but when you can't do that uh, you need to look at treatment options and uh, some of these things can be identified through looking at epidemiological models so looking at the host uh, the environment and the agent and then how that agent is transmitted and how all of these things play um, into the same picture. So um, it's not necessarily related to uh, antibiotic resistance, but you know, looking at coronavirus, um, you know, we have pretty much anyone under the sun except for children are susceptible hosts in this scenario. Um, and then you've got your vector of droplet transmission um, through respiratory secretions and sometimes airborne transmission. Um, and your environment affects it because we're seeing people who live in, um, in poverty being more susceptible. Uh, maybe, you know, if you're taking public transportation all the time, if you don't have access to clean water, all these factors are gonna increase your likelihood of transmitting an agent. Um, and that's true for coronavirus and for pseudomonas and all of these other things. So from an epi perspective, we can look at the environment as a method of control. Um, in our hospital, you know, the treatment room and the tub room, that is a great place uh, that fosters bacterial growth. And so looking at those water filtration methods and things like that are really key here. Components of prevention. So on the left is kind of your standardized uh, ways to prevent infection. Um, and then on the right is kind of specific to the uh, burn population. So what we do and what you've noticed is having patient specific equipment, um, having MDRO cases as a last case. And that's so, you know, if there is any low risk of transmission after doing all of the disinfection and environmental controls that you're still limiting uh, this possibility. However, you'll, you also have noticed that oftentimes your MDRO kids are your sickest kids, and so your sickest patients often need to go as your first case. So, the, you know, these are all suggestions and guidelines, but they're not requirements. You've got to do what's best for each individual patient and then kind of look at, you know, the whole picture as prevention 
uh, from a public health perspective. Private isolation rooms until wounds are healed, uh, hand hygiene in and out of patient care areas, having hand washing specific sinks so that when you're um, you know, flushing something from a bed pan or you know, you're washing your soiled hands, that those things are not uh, contaminating your faucets and your filters and that when you go to wash your clean hands, it's not going to create any retrograde contamination. Positive pressure rooms are really important. So all of our positive pressure rooms on the ICU uh, basically push the air outside the room so that you know we don't suck in air and contaminate the patient's wounds from whatever may be living in the corridor. Terminal cleaning and disinfection. So disinfecting everything with a disinfectant that has a um, short contact time or kill time so that it doesn't evaporate and then making sure that if anything that can't be cleaned it's thrown away or repurposed in a way that limits the risk of transmission to uh, other patients and then personal protective equipment such as gown and gloves that you know is becoming more and more important as you're seeing um, and then detailed surveillance and tracking so our weekly surveillance culture program is valuable because it helps us look at the unit as a whole and helps us identify any outbreaks that may happen. Um, you know, it's not a perfect system because you're just culturing one site on every patient, um, kind of in a standardized method every week, but it's a good um, research tool and a good identifying tool. And, you know, if we see an increase in pseudomonas on one week, we may need to culture more patients or do uh, more specific um, infection prevention measures, do more strict isolation. Coronavirus has helped us a lot in that sense that we've you know, put everyone on a level three precaution. We have um, really strict universal masking and visitation policies. I think coronavirus, the silver lining, is that it has improved the infection prevention of a lot of different uh, efforts kind of across the country, not only for respiratory diseases, but also for things that are transmitted via contact. So what influences pre prescribing practices for um, antibiotics? Um, everything kind of impacts this, and again, this is more useful for the provider, but um, I think it's interesting from like a sociology standpoint. Um, you know, you think that it's really clear cut. I don't want to uh, continue antibiotic resistance. I don't want to impact it any further, so I'm not going to give my patients antibiotics. But in lots of studies, when they interviewed surgeons specifically and they asked them, you know, like, how are you going to help reduce the use of antibiotics? And a lot of these anecdotes are going to be like, okay, well, I've got a infant in my operating room and a parent that is expecting me to do everything I can to possibly save this kid. And you're asking me to not use antibiotics, but I wanna do everything in my power to save this child. And if that means using antibiotics, it is truly the best thing for this patient, even though it's not the best thing from a public health perspective. So I think that's an interesting ethical dilemma that a lot of providers are going to have. Um, and so it's going to be, you know, what are what does their peer group say? Um, what is the communication between different physicians? What is a hospital supporting? What does the evidence say? And then also, what are the pa patient's attitudes and desires? If you've ever had an infection um, or a cough or bronchitis or anything, and you've gone to an urgent care, and they've said, oh, you know, take these test long pearls and drink lemon water and you know, take some vitamin C and get some rest and then you're still coughing three weeks later and you don't want to go back to that urgent care and say, hey, give me antibiotics. But then, you know, somewhere down the line, they give you a Z pack and you feel 100% better. Next year when you get sick, that's in your mind. And so those attitudes and desires really fuel, um, you know, prescribing practices. When you have things like Prescani surveys and patient satisfaction, I think a lot of hospital systems feel some degree of pressure. So there, the pressure for public health educators to educate people in general about antibiotic usage and kind of the steps that you should take before you take an antibiotic are really, really critical here. And your role as nurses is going to be when you're, when you're talking to families and they're asking you, well, I heard this on the news, it's kind of dismantling any preconceived notions that they might have. In a burn population, it's gonna be relatively easy because those patients do need those antibiotics most of the time. But in the outpatient setting, or you know, when you move on to different things, these may be things that you're gonna think about um, and the interaction between all of these. And then your last thing is cost and um, you know, how it affects patients, how easily it is for that patient to take it. You know, can a patient get the same antibiotic in Mexico that they can here? 
Do they have the money to buy it at the pharmacy? Um, all of these things are really important in terms of influencing prescribing practices. So what are some ways to navigate all of this uh, complexity? And I think these tips can be used not just about antibiotic prescribing, but pretty much any public health intervention that's happening right now. Um, talking to patients and families about infections and antibiotics. Describing the difference between infection and colonization. I remember when we used to isolate a lot of outpatients, especially with our patients who um, may not be as educated about what infections are, the term isolation uh, makes them very afraid. I actually see this with some people who have COVID. So the kid tests positive and they don't have any symptoms. And you tell the mom and the kid, you're gonna have to stay in this apartment for 10 days until you're deemed no longer infectious. And they think, oh my gosh, I'm sick, my patient is sick and you're putting me in this room. And so it's really important to use the right words here and not get things lost in translation because you wanna make sure that parent and that patient know that no, your child is not sick right now, but they do have the potential to make somebody else sick. For burns, you think about it as, you know, it's really good that your patient is colonized with this bacteria and not actually infected, but they do have the possibility to spread this around our hospital and make kids very sick who used to be like your patient, your child when they were in the ICU maybe three weeks ago. So putting things in perspective and trying to give a little bit of empathy that you do understand what they're feeling, but that there is you know, empowering them to take actions to protect somebody else, I think is a really effective method that I've experienced. Um, describing why you can't treat a virus with antibiotics is also really important. I think we can all hear that once in a while from a, a provider is that, you know, you're, you have a viral infection and giving you a ZPAC is not gonna work right now. Um, creating a narrative, uh, sometimes kids don't understand words like colonization and infection. So you make it a little story, you tell him there's a little bacteria and he's living on your hand, he's not making you sick, he just sometimes lives there. Things like that I think can make it more um, fun for the kids, empower them, let them name the bacteria. I, I found a lot of success with that um, as patients enter the outpatient setting when you're trying to teach them basic infection prevention measures. Um, explain why you have made the decision you made. If this is, you know, it can go either way, you don't need to explain clinical decisions that you've made to anybody really, but sometimes it helps um, if you have got disgruntled families or patients. Um, but they're demanding antibiotics. Some, this is more for an outpatient setting. If you, you know, go down the route of becoming a nurse practitioner and you work in an urgent care, giving, the, giving them the option of returning for a prescription if symptoms do not improve. So uh, sometimes it's enough for people just to get something to treat their symptoms. So test long pearls or um, ibuprofen or Tylenol, just giving them uh, some direction being like, okay, you've got a headache or body aches, take this three times a day for the next week and if it doesn't improve, call me and we can work on something else as a way to kind of defer antibiotic usage, making them feel like they're still in control but not contributing to the growing uh, resistance in, in the world really. So this is a little bit of what I said before, acknowledge the patient's pain and suffering, uh, let them know what they don't have, um, let them know what is uh, prevalent in the community. So, you know, this is really applicable to coronavirus right now. Set realistic expectations, choose your terms carefully. This is like your patient is, your child is sick, infected, colonized, uh, consider a delayed prescription, um, and then consider giving a prescription just to treat symptoms. So overall, your goal, not just about you know, antibiotic resistance, but also uh, bacterial resistance in the PICU, just talking to your patients, learn about your population, gain cultural competency, and be compassionate. You may never know, and hopefully will never know what it is to experience having a child in the ICU with a severe burn, and on top of that, having an organism that you can't pronounce is, uh, you know, you turn on the news and they call it a superbug, and they say it's like a global, you know, force. These things are really scary. So it's your job to kind of help ease that transition and make them feel like, hey, I understand what you're going through and I'm here with you. Um, and you know, you may have more success communicating that with somebody who shares your language versus someone that you have to go through a translator to speak to, um, someone who is from a clinical background versus someone who's not. Uh, these are all important things that can make infection prevention more successful, uh, less fearful and kind of empowering everyone to take the right steps that they need to take in order to protect themselves and others.
that's my dog, Louis Pasteur. Um, does anyone have any questions? New. No.